Hello. Hello. Adua Bengita, Deborah, is it better? Hello. A bit. Ah, I'm funny, sir. I'm funny, sir. Nani jemfu ya ze beta. Mami ya kushi ya. Ba Mr. J. Ok. Mr. J. Yes. Please, can you like snap it and send it to us so we can copy the news? No, I've done that. I've, I've put that uh, in the group. The news? Yes. I've taken okay. it. Uh, it's in the group. So... We we're talking about how the first law it relates to um, inertia. Okay, so now we overcome our own inertia. Okay, we overcome our own inertia or our own masses in some situation. And how do we overcome our own inertia? You see, when, when you are in a car, when you are in a car, and the car suddenly moves, okay, and the car suddenly moves, what you observe is that once the car begins to move, you will still be going backwards in your seat. Though the car is moving, but you would initially be going certain backwards, going backwards in your seats for some time before your body adjusts to the new change in the car's velocity. Please, have you made that observation before? Yes. yes. Good. So you um, initially, once the car is in motion, you will resist that motion because you are moving you are moving in the uh with the velocity of the car okay but once the car suddenly begins to move because naturally every body would resist a change in the velocity while the car is in um in motion moving forward you will be leaning backwards in your seat now to adjust yourself to the new velocity of the car the seat will usually be pushing against you, okay? So you go backwards and then you are pushed by this car seat. Then you tune yourself to the new velocity of the car. That is how to first overcome your, your own body's inertia. Two, if you are in a car and there is a sudden brake, okay, the driver suddenly applies a brake the car would be decelerating or would try to come to a stop. Here, there is a sudden what change in velocity of the car. Is that okay? Are you there? Are you, are you there? Yes, please. Because, please. Now, because naturally bodies resist change in velocity, while there is a sudden brake which brings the car to a stop or uh, reduces its velocity. You see, you would also be, though there's a brake, okay, but you will be moving forward. You will be moving forward, okay, <laughs> until, until if you are not with a seat belt, you hit, you hit 
uh, the front um, the front side of the driver's seat, or you hit the dashboard to change your position to to the normal car's velocity. Okay, and this is this is the reason why when you are in a car, you are advised to put on a seat belt because when there is a sudden change in velocity, as in when the car suddenly stops or an, an oncoming car collides, there is a head-on collision. The head-on collision, there will be a force which will um, cause the car to decelerate or stop, okay? But because of your body inertia, when there is that force to, causing it to suddenly change velocity or stop, you will still be moving forward because of your body's inertia. So if you don't have seat belt on, you can crash, okay, um, the, the steer or the dashboard. Or in some even, in some situations, you can be thrown off through the windscreen of the car. Please, I hope you are with me. You, you can be tr uh, thrown through the windscreen of the car. So that's why it's advisable to have your seat belt on because of Newton's first law of motion or the law of inertia. That is to overcome your own body's inertia. Now, what happens is that if, if you are in a car and there is this unfortunate hit to the car, okay, the hit or the force exerted on the car we change the car's velocity, you would also resist that change by moving forward. But you move forward according to the magnitude of the force which hits the car. So you, you, you see, you look at a heavy car hitting yours. You also move forward with that speed. But if you have your seatbelt on, it could, it could it quick, quickly, I mean, draw you back to, to readjust to the change in velocity which has suddenly happened. Please, are you with me? Are you okay? Yes, please. Any yes, questions? Please. Any question? All right. Now, second law. There's Newton's second law of motion. As I said, the first law explains the relationship between force and motion. And the second law also explains how to measure this force which causes motion. Before an object moves, there must be an external force. How do we calculate or measure this external force? Okay, and on what variables does it depend? Hence, Newton's second law of motion. So second law of motion. Now we said that for motion to occur, Nani Jenfua, what do we need for motion to occur? Um, there should be application of an external force. Good. So, there should be an application. So, there should be an external force. And once there is external force, what happens? Once there is a net force or external force, what happens? What happens to the body? Deborah. Once there is an, yeah, the, body. Yeah. the body does what? It moves. Uh, Be technical. Once there is an external force, what happens? The body does what? It's in motion. Uh, be technical, yes. 
somebody else, once there is an external force, what happens? The body accelerates. So the net, net force or external force is directly proportional to acceleration. Acceleration of a body. Once there is an external force, we say the body accelerates. But what happens to the what happens to the initial velocity of the body? What happens to the initial velocity? What happens to the initial velocity of the body? Who is who is who is talking? <laughs> Deborah. Benjita, Deborah, Deborah, I have two Deborahs. Adwa, Adwa Mponsa. Uh -huh. What happens to the initial velocity? Nico, Nanefua, Mamia Kosia, Eliza. Talk. Once the body accelerates, initially, what will happen to the velocity? Hello? To increase, it will change. I find increase. I agree with you, but there will be a change in velocity from initial to final. Okay. All right. So we 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 realize from this relation that external force or net force is directly proportional to acceleration. F net we can say is equal to a constant of proportionality times the acceleration. Now this constant of proportionality is the non-changing mass, the non-changing mass of the body. So we realize F net is equal to M a, telling you that the net force is directly proportional to the acceleration. Now, the greater the net force, the greater will be how the body accelerates. Okay, so this is how to measure the net force, which has to be applied for before an object moves. Measurement, measurement of the net force or external force that must be applied for an object to move. So I told you that the first law establishes the relationship between force and motion. The second law explains how this external force can be measured. Is that okay? Now, by this relationship, we can, we can derive something. F is already proportional to acceleration. Meaning, for F1, this will be directly proportional to acceleration one. If there is a new force F2, this will be directly proportional to A2. But provided mass of the body is kept constant. Provided the mass of the body is kept constant. Now, if you take the ratio of the forces F1 on F2, this will be equal to A1 on A2. And this is a relationship that can be used to determine the magnitude of acceleration Okay, with regards to 
the forces apply to it, but the condition is that at a constant mass of the body. Example, example. If a force of 50 Newton produces. We say that it's coming, send a shock to the group. You can see. Not really, no. Hey, produces. I'm coming. If a force of 50 Newton produces an acceleration. of three meter per second square. What, what will be the acceleration? Will be the acceleration? What, what will be the acceleration when the force is quadrupled. What will be the, the force, uh, the acceleration when the force is quadrupled? Okay, look at it whilst I take a shot of the work and put it on the platforms. I do for Yes, please. I've sent it. Given, thank you. Okay, so please, those of you can see. What have you had after the trial? What have you had? Hello. What what have you gotten for the trial? Deborah, Adwa, Nicole. Hello. Uh -huh. Amia Kusia, Eliza. Okay. Okay, you have 12. Adwa, you have 12. Okay, let's see. So, all that we are saying is that the first force is 50. 50 Newton would produce an acceleration of three. A is equal to three meter per second square. Then what happens if the force, the first force is quadruple? So F2 is equal to quadruple means four times the initial one. So four times F1 which is equal to four times 50. And this is 200 Newton. So using this, F1 on F2 is equal to A1 on A2. Okay. So let's put them in. F1 is 50. A1, um, F2 is 200. And A1 is three. A2, we don't know. Therefore, let's make A1 the subject. We have 50 times A2 is equal to three times 200. This is 50 
divided by 50. So we have this four. So A2 is equal to 12 meter per second square. Is that okay? And here it's on condition that the mass is constant. So when you increase, we said that F is directly proportional to A, meaning increase in the force will cause an increase in the acceleration. That's why A2 is equal to 12 meter per second squared. Please, are we okay? Are we okay? Yes. Okay. Now we can also have this situation. So we are looking at how to determine either the acceleration or the force. We are also saying that F, this is F is equal to MA, implies that acceleration is equal to F over M. Here, well, all that we are saying is that acceleration is inversely proportional to mass, provided, provided force F is constant. So the condition for acceleration being inversely proportional to the mass is that force must be kept constant. So here it means that if we have two masses, mass one will give us an acceleration one. So A1 is inversely proportional to one over M1. A2 is one on M2. Here, provided force is constant. When you take a ratio of A1 on A2, we have one over M1 times M2 over one. I hope you are not you are not lost here. If you are lost, tell me so that I explain further. You can't be lost. So a1 on A2 is equal to M2 on M1. And this one, which connects acceleration to masses, is on condition that the force F must be constant. Please, are you okay with this relation? Are you okay? Hey, you won't talk? Yes, please. Example. Example. A force of a constant force exerted on a five kilogram mass produces an acceleration of of three okay yeah, yeah five meter per second square what will be the acceleration if the if a second mass is increased to 
three times the initial mass. Yeah, let's start with. Time to go a short, eh? So those of you who can see, please give it a try. Mr. Adria, please, can you send a question to me? To who? Please, to me, Eliza. Okay. So, I'm sending it. Deborah, are you there? Yes, please. Okay, I've sent it. Okay, Adwa, yes, I've seen it. So we'll go through, so you can use it to mark what you've done, okay? All right, so let's see it. So solution. A constant force. So here, F is constant. So the force exerted on F1, um, M1 and M2 are the same. But what is M1? M1 is equal to five kilograms. A1 is equal to five meter per second squared. So what is M2? We are told that M2 is three times M1. So if this is three times M1, then this is three times five kilogram. And so it's equal to 15 kilogram. Now, before we even um, so, we know acceleration to be inversely proportional to the mass, provided the force is kept constant, meaning that when the mass increases, acceleration would have to decrease. In M2, we have an increased mass. So obviously, we need to get an acceleration which is less than the first one. Please, are we OK? Ladies, are you OK? Yes, please. Good. So we haven't we haven't solved it, but we are using the theory to judge what we expect. So A one is one on M one. A two is one on M two. Therefore, if we go by A2 on A1, and I'm doing this before because we need A1. This will be equal to one on M2 divided by one on M1, okay? And this A2 on A1 will therefore be equal to one on M2 
times M1 on 1, giving us M1 over M2. Okay. Mr. Idia. Hello. So then you can use either A1 on A2 or A2 on A1. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm, all that we need is that we are looking for the second acceleration. Okay. So what is M1? M1 is 5. What is M2? 15. So this is equal to 1 on 3. Therefore, A2 on A1, which is equal to 1 on 3, if we are looking for A2, A2 is one third, one third of A1. So what happens is that because of this mass, okay, the acceleration of, this, of the second situation will be when we divide the first acceleration by three. So what is A1? A1 is five. Five divided by three will be equal to one point, one point, uh -huh. Eight seven. Eight seven. Six seven. Eight seven. Yes, say approximately six seven meter per second square. Okay. So when the force is kept constant, the second acceleration will be one third of the first acceleration. So these are some of the things we can be calculating using Newton's second law. Any question? Another expression for Newton's second law. Please, if you are copying this, quickly do so, so I can continue, right? Oh, you are done writing. Miss Tadia, can you send a My screen is breaking. The, the, Oh, I'll, I'll send a video to, to the group. Oh. Oh, oh, that will not help. Hello. Would that help? <laughs> OK. You see, we, we earlier defined the net force to be directly proportional to the acceleration, which is true. Therefore, the external force or the net force is equal to the constant mass m times acceleration. Now, an external force applied would also cause a change in velocity. So we can also break this down, acceleration to be equal to delta V divided by T. Are we there? So the next force is actually M times change in velocity, final velocity minus initial velocity, all divided by Time. Now, when we multiply the mass by the velocities, we have mv minus mu all divided by t. What is mv? What is mv? And what is mu? Momentum. So, mass and velocity is momentum. So, this gives us final momentum minus initial momentum divided by time. The numerator is basically change in momentum over T. So we can also um, explain Newton's second law of motion using change in momentum, okay? That the net force, 
the net force, Newton's second law of motion, second law of motion. states that the rate of change of momentum on a body the rate of change of momentum with time sorry Momentum with time with time on a body is directly proportional to the external. external force applied. So this is how you can also state the second law, that the rate of change of momentum with time on a, on a body is directly proportional to the external force applied, or at the acceleration, Okay, on a on a of a moving body or on a moving body is also directly proportional to the external force applied on the body. These two situations all explain Newton's second law of motion. Any question? So either we define it or we explain it in terms of acceleration or you do so in terms of change in momentum. Another observation we could make from this or inference we can draw from this is that F net or the external force, when we multiply this, the external force by time, this is equal to change in momentum or MV minus MU. So what is force times, force multiplied by time? This is what? F by T is what? Impulse. So the impulse is also equal to the change in momentum. So impulse is equal to change in momentum, J is delta P. So whenever you are asked to calculate for impulse, when you find the change in momentum is equal to impulse, or if you are asked to find the impulse, the change in momentum is also equal to the impulse. So they are complementary. Newton's second law of motion. Any question? No question. Let's look at third law. Newton's third law of motion. Mr. Pedro, please, can you send a picture of me? My okay. network is too bad, so I can't hear what you're saying. All right. Mirabel, I think that's you. Bye, I'm sending the shots. 